Political discourse, um, it's made it more public, it's made it more transparent, it's something that's happening all the time, constantly. Uh, the word hyperlocal is woefully overused, so let's pretend I didn't just say it. But in terms of allowing someone in Ottawa, which would be me, to follow what's going on politically, not just in Ottawa and what I'm covering, what I'm live blogging at the time, but I can also pay attention to Toronto City Council meetings. I can follow people that are tweeting from there. I can keep track of Peter McKay's announcement on the convention center, even though I'm getting ready for another session, just by keeping an eye on those local reporters. That's coming at it from a journalistic perspective, but I have to think, you know, as all journalists are, I'm also a, a, a passionate consumer of news. So I think that people who use it to stay informed and stay in touch are, it's amazing how much smaller it makes the world. Again, I was, um, during the last month, I was covering stuff going on in the UK as well, the News of the World hearings and the parliamentary committees there. I was able to talk to, I mean by talk, reply to on Twitter and actually get into conversations with journalists who were covering it on the ground there. It made it all feel so much closer and so much nearer and the immediacy was astonishing. Now whether or not that's translating into people who may have other things to do with their, better things to do with their time and don't get paid to obsess over the news, whether they're taking part in that as well, I'm not sure, but I am seeing more of that. The other thing that uh, is quite remarkable in Canada is at the moment we've never had a situation where a cabinet minister or an MP or a politician has an unfiltered channel from his fingers, in this case his thumbs, to the world. Usually one goes through an intermediary, there's always going to be something they're blocking. Uh, attending a press conference, you know, it's journalists who ask the questions and ministers who respond. That's not quite as unfiltered as just a minister of the crown out there, you know, talking to Canadians in a really unfiltered way. I imagine that puts terror into the heart of directors of communication. Well, that's, that's sort of one of the complaints that's always made against sort of real-time reporting is this notion that, you know, you're not actually providing sort of a filtered, coherent, cogent, thoughtful response, which I'm sorry, I think is just poppycock because it's actually not that hard to think and listen and type at the same time. It's something that I've had to do, again, because I do live blogging, I have been in a I'm just used to a situation where I'm always processing information here. I'm figuring out a way to pass it along, but I'm also trying to add something that, that you know, some, some commentary and some context and my own observations. You get sort of a raw look at what goes in, on inside my head, which admittedly can possibly be a terrifying thing at times. But when it comes to things like, um, I covered the, uh, the Oliphant Commission, that, that was the Mulroney, the Commission of Inquiry into Mulroney and Bearhead and Schreiber and all of that stuff. That was probably the most fun I've ever had journalistically in terms of a running story where because I was there every day and because I would and when you're live blogging for the record unlike anyone else you can't actually glaze over halfway through you have to be paying attention to every word as it's said you have to be filtering it. that's your job so you end up taking in a lot more of that information you you end up learning stuff and you end up figuring stuff out and you end up having this sort of an in ability to analyze I'm sure there you know you'll get more some more depth from someone who has some takes a more thoughtful approach but I try really hard to provide that sort of content as well much like when you brought television into the House of Commons and actually television at committee as well the more attention you put on I mean politicians are kind of like you know eight-year-olds they love attention negative or positive it's all good Although they do tend to, particularly when you're in a situation where you have parties that worry if an MP is going to go off on a little freelancing journey, if this is going to turn into you know, a huge story and a huge issue the next couple of days, that's definitely going to be a concern. I think, it's, um, I think it, brings out, it brings out the best in MPs that are excellent MPs. It exposes perhaps the not so, um, it, it exposes aspects of some MPs that perhaps shows that maybe they're not as good at that form of discourse as others. It makes it very raw and very clear. It's, it's a lot more organic and a lot more candid than question period or even house debate because it's more of an informal discussion. So I think you do get a better sense as to, as to who can kind of speak on their feet, who can think on their feet, and who is really just good at reading talking points.